amazing moderator, Fedra Hrusus, who actually specifically came from Washington, D.C. to be able to moderate this panel. We are very excited. We're very happy you could do it. So Fedra Hrusus, she is the Chief Innovation Officer for Libra Group. And Libra Group is a group of 31 companies in different sectors. But more importantly, she was a technical commissioner in, in the administration of Barack Obama for three years. And now she's in the private sector. Amazing. This is impressive. We're so happy to have you here, Fedra. So the floor is yours. Please uh, enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you for the very kind introduction. To the technical commissioner to figure out the microphone, maybe. Thank you for the very kind introduction. I, it is on? Perfect. We're here today for what I hope will not just be an engaging, but also very provocative panel, knowing this group of panelists, on one of my favorite topics, which is the emerging world of data and data science. And specifically, we're going to talk about the role of Ukraine in that world, which is also emerging rapidly. You may or may not know that 90% of today's data was created in the last two years. And it's not slowing down. Every day, we all collectively generate an amount of data that's equivalent to a company the size of Google. It's simply staggering and largely due to all the dark data that we're creating, all this unstructured data from, our, from the web, from social media, from our phones, from our watches. If you're in this room, you likely believe, as I do, that understanding, tapping into, and innovating with data has a potential to change everything we do for the better. And ignoring or drowning in this data is really at our own company or organization's peril. In my own experience, both with the US government and with the private sector, moving a company or organization data forward is very challenging. It's very tricky, and I'm the first to admit it. And ironically, Getting a company organization to a place where it relies less on humans and more on data actually needs very smart humans to cross that bridge. And that's why we have this, this panel here. So in front of us, we're very fortunate to have three very esteemed panelists. Um, I'll start with, on my left, Boris Pratyuk, leads research and development at Chiklam, one of, the, one of the leading digital services firms for the Fortune 500. We have Alexei Skripnik, a member of Ukrainian parliament who leads the subcommittee on innovation and IP and was also the founder of Elex, a leading software engineering firm in Europe. And finally, we have Alex Friedland, managing director of Soros Fund Management, and who's directly invested in and sits on the boards of companies that are being disrupted by data today. So with this, I want to begin really by opening up um, a question to our panelists about what, the, what is the most exciting data science project that your company has been working on? What, are, what kind of things are Ukrainian firms being asked to do with data? Alexi, do you want to begin? Oh, hello, everybody. Uh, very nice to see you. Uh, I'm a member of parliament, and I cannot be involved in operational activity of any company, but I'm still on board of my company and have aware of what's going on. Uh, so uh, for me, first of all, big data. Sometimes, ironically, uh, the project of big data is possibility to read data second time. Mm -hmm. So companies say, hey, we have such a tremendous amount of data and uh, our boss is asking what the hell, what we need to put this money in these big uh, centers. So you will be very glad at least that you will read them second time. So, but uh, from the viewpoint of the uh, ideas of what we are doing, we're trying to find the possibilities to find a real source of information. That the big data giving us another view. Uh, of course, we're understanding that uh, if you have the chaos in input, you will have the chaos in output. But if you will make the good mathematical model, if you will try to find the way to un how to analyze the data, you can receive the real fantastic results. One of the projects which we are doing is uh, just like a one of the biggest retailers in the world. They ask us about the pricing. The question, what the price we can put for the several kind of things which we are selling. How we can find the real price. And it's everything in the world is connected. If you are uh, selling the gasoline, you uh, and lower price, people buy more cars. Buying more cars, more gasoline, and so on. So it's very uh, interconnected things. And this project helping to the uh, customers to make the analysis of what is going on, how they can put uh, the real price. So we take into consideration the data from all of their competitors, of the prices, of the world, and so on and so forth. So it's a very multifactorial model where the level of Ukrainian mathematicians 
we, I wanted to emphasize this at the first, that it's not only the software problem. Mm -hmm. We are talking, uh, we have to understand that this is more mathematical problem. Uh, is enough to find the solution of one of the biggest retailers in the world? Alex, as a, uh, Boris, I'm sorry, as a, as the head of research and development for Chiclam, can you, or is there any case study that comes to mind that you're really excited about? Yeah, hello everyone. So, yeah, so the, the big data and data itself, it's like, it's new oil, you know, we just opened that uh, a couple of years ago and now we, it will grow and grow. And uh, sometimes it's so, so clear that in retail you have a lot of clients and, and like your example, let's, you just need to analyze that and gain gain formulas and prediction out of that. But sometimes I have a really cool example of the project where data science, clear data science applied was, uh, that was a Norway company which uh, deal with uh, fish farm analysis. So they, they have a big problem if you have parasites in the fish. The, in one week, these parasites grow up from the small bacteria to the worm and one fish die and 200,000 fishes die in cage and all area around that farm will be isolated and you will pay huge penalty to the government for not uh, looking at your fish. So they have four, four and a half thousand uh, farms in Norway and you, every farm. So it's all multiplied. So they have billions of fishes and how you can control the fish quality. So the problem is they now they go to sea, take away fish and come back to lab to analyze with the eyes of the biologists, do they have worms or not. And our client said that we will optimize that process with the help of technology. We will put the high resolution camera under the water and we'll do solution where we will all uh, through the optical fiber stream the real time data 4K video to headquarter and biologists no need to go to sea and any weather they see in office and analyze 24 seven. But you need so much biologists to scale this and you cannot scale this with uh, people. You can scale this with machines. With by the way, by the way, this is the most active problem for, to the medicine also, that the amount of data is impossible to check by the people. Yeah. So so and with this, so to, to, to scale this solution, you can you need to build robot which will replace biologist's eyes, and we're looking for uh, for the fish under the water and detect the fish, get the image and analyze uh, do they have parasites or not. So detect parasites, and you know. 10 years ago, it wasn't possible because of the lack of knowledge in deep learning. Today, NVIDIA or other big brands develop the infrastructure for the uh, machine learning, deep learning design. Google heavily invested here, DeepMind, so other big companies. And our specialists in Ukraine, they're following this huge trend and apply this deep learning in this project. So we were able to replace human eyes with a computer vision to detect the parasites. So that's optimization of the food farming industry grow and uh, that's fantastic and as soon as i mentioned so we here talk about um you the role of ukraine in data science world so the, the just good fact which i want proud to mention that first neural network for analysis was invented in kiev in ukraine so that was done in 1965 and uh, that's all machine learning around the world know that's after so that ukrainians so that's just good to know. That, that brings me to my next question, which is, you know, it's not surprising that Fortune 500 companies turn to software and data engineering firms to, uh, to solve and scale their problems and prototype their problems, but why Ukraine? So obviously there's some history there. Uh, Alex, could you give us your perspective on why do you think sure. Ukraine is positioned for this? Thank you very much. First of all, it's a great honor to be here in this wonderfully designed house. Um, and I'm very happy that our portfolio company, Cyclum, uh, was able to contribute to that. And with that, I'll finish advertising Cyclum. But uh, what I wanted to say that um, uh, the short answer to your, to your question is uh, Ukraine is a house for uh, very smart, very intelligent, extremely well-educated people. And that's a well-known fact. I, re I read recently in, um, I believe, a New York Times uh, article that a squirrel, an average squirrel that you see in the park, remembers 10,000 locations of places where he could find a nut, a walnut, a pine nut. Does it make a squirrel smart? Prob intelligent, as we would say. Not necessarily, right? The fact that it has access to 10,000 
data points and remembers that and knows even how to design the path of collecting largest amount of uh, nuts for itself, this still does not make it intelligent. Intelligence require intelligence is multidimensional uh, thing. It's not a linear ladder. Even all of us in this room, not not squirrels, it's always hard to say who is smarter. Who it's not linear. We know that there are there are things like guts, etc. So to answer your question, Ukrainian tradition, uh, educational tradition, is such that it gives very broad education in its great universities, Kharkiv, Dnipropetrovsk, Dnipro, uh, Kiev, Lviv University. Uh, I don't know how many of you know, um, uh, but uh, one of the best mathematical school in the world at the beginning of 20th century existed in Lviv. Any, any, I'm, I'm a mathematician by education, um, uh, and I know, I know the theorems and books were written that I still study to this day. Um, the, that's a legacy of uh, 19th century and beginning of 20th century. The legacy of 20th century, we all know that the defense industry uh, of Soviet Union was largely built in 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 Dnipro, that time Dnipropetrovsk, Kharkiv, and and other and Kiev and other cities. That created an extremely strong educational background. It takes many generations to destroy that, and Ukraine was able to preserve it through very difficult times. Today, if you travel through Silicon Valley, if you travel through headquarters of major corporations, whether they're in uh, London, Paris, Switzerland, you always find Ukrainian engineers. You always find Ukrainian specialists. What makes them different? What, what differentiates them from others? Broad education. And it's fundamental education in mathematics, not necessarily uh, being able to program Java. That's relatively easy skill to learn. But to know advanced mathematics, and now, with that, on that historical education, the fact that in, when you study in, in Ukrainian universities, you become not just a mathematician, but you could take classes in biology and chemistry. You're just very broad fundamental engineer. If, if, and that's what makes Ukraine very, very attractive. So we are yeah. And we're hungry. That always helps. Uh, and if I can add a few cents, we like the project Mission Impossible. That's right. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's very important. That's right. Can you expand on that? Oh yes. <laughs> you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes the big motivation is not only to receive money, but to do something valuable which nobody uh, didn't do before. And this is just like it's finding the interesting that this is, can be motivator for the people in Ukraine. Uh, especially science oriented and especially when you see that you can implement the results in real life. So we have a lot of projects which can be uh, uh, say, the, hey uh, guys, how is it possible you're doing this uh, in the beginning of my life uh, as developers there was a, a huge part that brought us the project and say, hey guys, if you will do this in one week, we'll give it the, the project to you. Uh, one of my developers did the work which was uh, have to do in one week, but well done in 15 minutes. Uh, so from this time, I'm understanding that uh, the measurement of uh, the people uh, by uh, brains is not right. The right measurement is by mind, uh, because you really uh, differentiator is the level of understanding how you deep in the problem. It's one, and the second that we usually have in the good combination of mathematic and uh, uh, engineering education. One of our customers, we have the project where we doing tremendous uh, show uh, at the beginning. Uh, uh, they give us a work, you know, Mission Impossible to say, hey, here the engine which is not working. If you do the software, uh, maybe you will receive the work. They say, okay, we'll try, we'll turn back in one week, show the software, software was working. They, hey guys, how is possible our engineers are not able to do this for one year. Can you explain what was, uh, so what the problem? Use Google before asking stupid questions. Yeah. We found <laughs> the characteristics of this engine in internet, wrote differential equation, resolved them. Stop, 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 stop. Who wrote differential equation for you? No, 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 you're not understanding. We wrote by ourselves, we are good engineers. Oh, it's not possible. Uh, engineers are not writing differential equation. Mathematicians are writing. And, and, and code, and code at the same time. Yeah, yeah at the same time. 
Yes, so uh, the, this is just like, it's a very typical story. I can say that any company in Ukraine have a tremendous amount of such small uh, war games where we showed uh, our desire, our mission impossible, our qualification and our combination of mathematical and uh, software background. It's hard to, to think about education without thinking about diversity, at least in the United States. We were part of a big initiative with President Obama to make sure that computer science was for everybody, especially with data science where you have implicit biases. So tell me a little bit about diversity in, in computer science and data science in, in your firms, in, in universities in Ukraine. I, I can tell about the whole community because uh, just, uh, you know, we see a lot of ch changes, but regarding that question, uh, it just we had a different events and uh, the whole IT Ukraine community support that initiative of s basically that student initiative, some more social organizations. Which last one was Women Who Code. So that's only women gather uh, together to discuss that's how they did this and and that was a kind of harassment that they did not accept uh, men to to speak. But after that they say okay we're talking about equality so they start accepting so we we but the good thing is it's uh, it's hugely changed so now we the the last uh, 10 people which join our company that's w i just uh, realized after the interviews that half of them girl second is boys so that's that's equality gender equality and and we don't see uh, and uh, we did a uh, in a we did a query in a company so how they see the problem and actually people don't care about that so they, they they don't see a real big difference like we are just colleagues we're working in one team in 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 my project i have project manager qa one gender and the developers other or opposite situation uh, and in data science it's equal equal so that's 50 50. if i can add a few cents to this question uh you know at the beginning alex was very successful company we are started as a man company with uh, no women inside. It just was uh, we were were stupid, honestly. <laughs> uh, now we have big amount of women in the company. We have near 40 percent, comparing to the market near 28 uh, in the United States. This figure, and honestly, we doesn't care. We're thinking that uh, Ukrainian women is our secret weapon, and uh, uh, especially clever Ukrainian women. Uh, and I think it's just like. It's, uh, but we doesn't care because we have equal opportunities and equal requirements. But from my experience, personal experience, I know that when we are selecting managing, ma management uh, to women to become to the same level, she have to spend more efforts. That's why if I have possibility, I select him just because I am understanding that I will receive better results. So, but uh, that's why we doesn't care. Um, this, is, this is very interesting to hear all these examples. I, I may date myself, but in 2008, I started a technology company in New York. And we were looking to outsource our software development, and we had looked to Ukraine. And the market was not nearly as mature, and that's, that's just a decade ago. It's, a, it's 10 years. So can you, can you walk me through what's happened in 10 years that's taken it from... Everything changed. Everything changed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can say that uh, during the last... 10 years we grew up the whole industry during the last four years we grew up the country so that's a lot of change so I don't know may maybe the main positive change that the the generation start thinking differently mm -hmm. and of course yeah yeah we, we, we can say that's uh, I don't remember what it's more than five years we have this tax good tax regulation for IT so we have special good climate for IT guys so that's allow us to keep talents in country not all of them so a lot of guys leave and that's my big pain because i trying to keep all the best in my country but we still continue collaboration and you saw a lot of ukrainians who come back and establish new companies so that's what's changed and i think the government the our country executives they understand that we still need to develop this uh, new market because they generate huge huge amount of revenue so I, I also think that um, a large generation of enge uh, Ukrainian engineers and scientists 
um, left uh, Soviet Union and end of 80s, beginning of 90s. By 2008, they built their careers in different uh, Fortune 400 companies, uh, and when uh, they, were, you know, when they succeeded and and became uh, CEOs and CTOs and CFOs of various companies in the West, they started uh, asking themselves questions: Could we go back to Ukraine? They became ambassadors in many ways of Ukrainian culture, and 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 they're comfortable with uh, what they knew about Ukrainian and Ukrainian talent and about their education. So many of them came here and, and saw that talent. Uh, many, many Ukrainian companies, who, uh, which are now in Lviv and Kiev, were started by, by those people, or at least with this first idea, first, first seed. Today, um, it's relatively easy to introduce Ukrainian talent to Western Western businesses because that that road was already open uh, in the in the last 10 15 years I think that that w w Ukraine is not the first country who did it uh, e Indian professionals uh, in 70s and 80s opened up Indian market for um, from inside and and I think that as uh, I hope that universities, Ukrainian universities, will establish good relationships with Western universities and be able to supply uh, that, uh, that that the road becomes two-way highway. That while many talented people go there, they have opportunity to come back, start businesses here, and, and so on and so forth. If I can add yeah. from the other side, I think that uh, for 10 years, last 10 years, the industry become more mature. I think it's the biggest difference. We're finding, uh, uh, you know, when we were very small companies, we were saying, hey guys, we know C++, <coughs> we know C, Java, etc., etc., all languages. But later we found that this is not important. Later we found that uh, this is a question of pain. We said, hey guys, where you have pain, we can help to reduce it, we can help you. Uh, now, in a lot of cases, uh, especially with the big data, when the big companies have a mass amount of uh, mo mobile devices, big, com big computers still they're using, a lot of infrastructure, and they have no clue what to do with this, so the good answer for them becoming digital transformation. And in some cases we are coming to a very big corporation, and we are not talking about, hey, we'll write you software. We're saying, hey, we'll help you to make your business a little bit better, doing this and this. So I think sometimes we even coming, we are doing projects with the companies where the level of the management is less than in Ukrainian companies. So we grow up and we now not dividing Ukrainian, uh, American, we just in the global world where we compete globally. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the main result for the last 10 years. That's great. So I mean that's a it's we've come a long way in ten years. I'd love to get each of your perspective on where Ukraine will be in in ten years, right? So what is your vision? What 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 does the country look like when it comes to data and data science and and supplying this for the world? With a proper investment in education, uh, Ukraine will be the leading house for s most sophisticated, most high end. Uh, services, whether it's in data science, AI, virtual reality, etc. It has all the ingredients required. It's actually already ahead of many, many countries. Um, and hunger is also one of the factors that also helps to contribute to that. Uh, but it's a fast-moving train. And if uh, Ukraine stop investing in into education and, and building on what it has, uh, th the, the, you know, the position in which it enjoys now will be easily lost. I'm sure it will not happen, um, but only if we keep talking about that and, and making sure it's invested. Yeah, and, and, and as a proof of that, so during the, you know, to understand what's happening in 10 years, we should understand what's happening pre before, yeah? So during that time, we established huge ecosystem of the private education, so different hubs, different communities. So 
four years ago I established the Android community because I was a, that in mobile uh, business. So we gather 400 professionals and say, hey, let's not do marketing here, don't uh, talk about la 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 la. So let's talk about the meat, how to solve the real problems. And that's what's make a difference because the, and the guys, I remember that guy, he came to the meeting and say, okay, I have real problem. I cannot write parallel script to do high performance. So that's a problem. And we sitting around 25 senior people and, and trying to give him advices, ideas, what she, he should try. And you know what's happening in a month? He come we back to next uh, gathering and he said, you know what? I tried, I write down all EDs, I try one, each by one by one and I found the solution. So that means we help some one of the, our clients through the community to solve that problem, he paid the bills, the old Ukrainians became happy, the new generation, he established the family, kids, and so on, so on, so on. So that's, you know. Uh, so, and why in 10 years, what will be? I think that that trend will keep going. So we will build more and more communities. We already mature in some um, hacker spaces, but that will become really more professional. So that will be why, you know, really, really mature, and in this community, you can just bring the client who will talk to the hackers, to the students in one space and ha get access to talents. And uh, you can just uh, in one city have all big companies, you can go around and that's bootstrap for the business. And of course, all teenagers see this and uh, they learn English. So they not only learn, they already speak. So if you will talk to 10 years ago to some teenagers, where is a post office or whatever, he cannot reply you. But now they almost, not super free, but that's just the beginning of the road. They can speak English. So that's open access to all educational information in the world. MIT, Coursera, all online courses they can read. And, and I expect that that will be a huge boom. And that's why we're so optimistic in terms of the, the future of this super complicated space. And Alexei. You know, I wanted to use uh, this floor and to talk as a member of uh, Ukrainian Institute of the Future and to talk about a little bit about one century. Because uh, honestly, uh, I am skeptical about the role of IT in this century. I'm more thinking about biotech. I'm thinking that life science has become the major science for the whole uh, mankind because the problem which we have for the mankind is bigger than only the big data. Uh, the artificial intelligence and all other. So uh, it will be connected with the life, with the quality of the life, with the food, with the energy, with all this question which is mostly biotech. And IT will be support like we, for example, nobody is now mostly not talking about power engineering. Why? Because it's just like it's industry which is mature and it's just only small development fraction where it's some new ideas, uh, sustainable energy and so on and so forth. So I think in that the same will be with IT. Uh, w that it will be more multidisciplinary uh, industry where you have not to know only the IT or the mathematics, but biology <laughs> will be becoming the major factor. Uh, genome will be becoming the major factor. And while educating to the IT, English, um, ma mathematics, we have to be well educated in uh, a lot of other spheres. So my prediction that uh, this will, uh, this things which is changing the world, and uh, this is things which is changing the Ukraine. That's wonderful. I want to note and see if we have time for questions. Um, I think I have a couple more questions, but I want to make sure that you, you have time as well. So let's throw, the, throw out the audience. Hi, my name is Nick Graham uh, from the Global Change Leaders. And we build um, ecosystems, learning ecosystems. So it's great to hear your points about education and, and the power of that. So we've heard a lot about the kind of logical um, right brain kind of education. What's your perspective on, given that AI is actually a lot of those functions, and are we actually educating for uh, empathy and for collaboration and, and the kind of uh, the, the right brain side of things? Just curious for your perspective on that overall. Uh, first of all, um, AI is not happening tomorrow uh, in the way sometimes people describe it. Uh, it's a multi-generational multi -generational process. In that process, um, we don't even understand today what it means to be 
humanly intelligent. Uh, it means so many things. Uh, I'm a professional investor. My wife is not at all. She's an artist, but I believe in her gut. If she tells me that this investment will not do well, I actually follow her advice. There's a second brain um, in the gut. <laughs> is that intelligence? And yes, or, it is. Or exam it's it wisdom. is? Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> but uh, th that's, um, th that's God, and, and there are lots of other things. How we think, we still don't know. Um, the primitive operations already substituted by robots. There are primitive operations in programming that cr sometime soon will be substituted by robots. Humans will be developing algorithms humans will, you know, and, and, so, and we don't even know what it means to develop algorithm. We define algorithm as something that we know last 30 years. That word will have a different meaning. I'm, I'm quite optimistic about that. Um, now, I do believe that we should be teaching classical Greek philosophy. I do believe that we should be teaching um, not just biology, but what we call the nature studying in, in schools, uh, which thinking. critical thinking and other things. You know, um, it's easy to say, to, to, to if, especially if you're a sixth grader and you come home and say, why do I need to study Plato and Socrates and all others? The answer is, is because you want to stay ahead of artificial intelligence. Because you don't know, we don't know, none of us know, how knowing classical Greek philosophy helps someone with investment decision or how it helps someone with uh, mathematical decision, but it does. The history of humankind and our evolution proved that it does. All of that. I mean, listening to music, classical music or rock and roll or African music, helps to develop intelligence. We're way, many, many generations away from uh, whatever you call it, artificial intelligence, being able to benefit from all those different things and, cre and, and substitute us. Uh, agreed, but I think uh, there's some studies showing that maybe 60% of jobs in the next 15 years might be transformed or lost. So it's, it's equipping people with the ability to adapt to that uh, rapidly accelerating change. I if I can make that everything will die and there was no electricity all blah 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 words so from my point of view in a lot of cases what we have now with artificial intelligence is the same buzzwords that we have with the problem of 2000 serious investigation from IBM from Paul Allen who is dividing the uh, mice brain is saying we're not understanding why this brain is so complicated. So we now, if you know this curve or what you're thinking about your qualification and how it's real, uh, so we are on the top of our unknown. So relax, we have at least 100 years to be uh, normal people without uh, the... Uh, to be adopted. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah. So we have time for the adaptation. But besides, the life always gives new challenges, luckily. And the challenges of uh, space exploration, because who knows if there is an asteroid coming our way, uh, and we'll need to accelerate that, or the challenges of managing weather. Uh, you know, there is no good mathematical model to this day that would have good prediction of the weather. We may all get stuck here tomorrow because of snow. Um, and we don't know that. And it's not just computers. It's not just uh, robots and uh, lots of electrons going through the pipes. It's things we can't even define today. And it will remain so, I think, for quite a few generations. Uh, yes, yeah, some people will lose jobs, but society will have opportunity to re-educate them quickly, if it wishes to do so. Yeah, and uh, I, I just want to, you know, if you, a lot of people ask me the same question as you do. Uh, like, uh, what, what do you think about, do the robots will stall the, you know, this assembling lines will be improved, or, and, 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 I, and everyone care about the more simple job. I say, let's take a look on the more complicated things like um, epilepsy prediction. So that was not possible to, you know, not uh, doctors don't know how to fight with the problem, but algorithm, data science, mathematician equation know how to predict that. So they see that pattern, 
which uh, people eyes, uh, doctor's brain cannot. So, and that's, uh, I, I will, you know, hold that this part of the, you know, business will be improved with the algorithms where people can, you know, live in more better conditions. But some, so some maybe if you have the job where you need to count how many people cross the line, Maybe that's not smart. So that's that should be replaced with something else. But that person can can take a life challenge, go to education, and uh, find much better job. So that's that's it. That's it. Our children should be prepared. They'll have two, three jobs in their lifetime, and that's will that will be normal. They will be collecting jobs. Uh, I mean, ta I'm talking about those who are 10 years old right now. They will be collecting jobs the way we thought about shoes, uh, because that's just the way it will be. The good thing about carrying a microphone, you can always ask a question when nobody <laughs> has a question. So um, it's more of a comment, but also a question. Uh, George Soros was very supportive of Ukraine during the past four years. And uh, since the inception of his foundation in the early 90s, he um, disbursed over $200 million uh, for support of the civil society. So two years ago, when we heard about the investment into Siklum of the Soros Fund Management, we were very excited. Because it's important that George Soros put his money where his mouth is, and it's it's great. So now we all look forward to that IPO of Cyclum, and we hope it will be a major success because it's going to be a major story for investors coming in into exiting and investment. In your opinion, you're based in New York. What Ukraine should do to attract more investors like George Soros? First of all, uh, Cyclum is not the only wonderful company in, in IT uh, market uh, and software development. There are hundreds of smaller companies, some as small as like three, four, five people. And um, we, we love the fact that they all exist. Uh, we don't view them as competitors. Uh, and so, you know, I, I hope Cyclum succeeds because we made that investment, but um, there are many, many more others. It's a very vibrant industry. Um, to answer your question, uh, the, there are two elements that I see very important for Ukrainian envi investment um, in environment to, to be attractive. Uh, one element is uh, the system of governance, policy making, and, uh, and courts uh, that are independent, truly independent. Uh, and that's kind of well known fact um, because that makes risks, political risks, manageable for investors. But the other factors every Ukrainian who travels to the West needs to be an ambassador of, of Ukrainian. Um, of Ukrainian values. Um, the world should know more about Ukraine. Um, there is large Ukrainian diaspora that is uh, very active but could be even more active. Uh, it has uh, lots of stories to take to the West um, and, uh, and be proud of those stories. Um, the, the, press all, all, uh, the press often uh, focuses on things that uh, do not uh, communicate good image of Ukraine. Uh, it, some money needs to be spent on helping creating the right image. Um, and that's, uh, that's an effort. Those are two things that I think are important. Does anyone have questions? If not, I, I have a couple more. Okay, well, we talked a little bit about this ecosystem building, right? So there's an ecosystem of smaller companies. I know that there are some startups. Tell, Talk to me a little bit about how this ecosystem was built and where you think it's going. Are there, will there be venture capital investments in Ukrainian startups? What is the, what is the future there? Yes. Next. If I can start, because the first IT cluster, and uh, here is Zhenya Utkin with whom we started OAPO, uh, Ukrainian Association of uh, Pro Software Developers. Uh, it was the first association. Uh, later, we have the IT Association of Ukraine, which is now the major association which is collecting the most of software developers. We have several more, which is uh, taking in part uh, telecom industry. Uh, we have now a very big startup community in Ukraine. Uh, besides this, we have very strong clusters in major cities like Kiev, Lviv. Dnipro, which is uh, started from Lviv. 
And I still remember it was, by the way, in the period you're asking, uh, because we at first when we were met, we were thinking that we are enemies because we each were stolen people from each other, thinking that this is just like we have no, uh, we think why we have to be together. Now we have a lot of questions to communicate, to work. Uh, the education is one of the this year. Our image, uh, the, the, uh, the PR is another sphere. Uh, we have a lot of common uh, problems. This is one of the question. And another, we see that our ecosystem is greatly changing, especially to such a force like Genia Sesoyev doing uh, with our ventures, uh, where, they, where we have now more and more product companies. And my opinion that uh, next few years will show how we'll have the product orientation that the Soros funds and other funds, investment funds, will invest not only uh, to try to invest to the product Ukrainian companies. This is what, what we see now, that the uh, situation is changing dramatically, especially for the last four years, that we have a lot of good products companies. So if I can use such analogy, we have a very good soup of mix of uh, product, of service, of educational uh, companies, which is uh, giving us possibility to grow up. Uh, just to use, okay, sorry, Borsh is the better, the better Ukrainian word for, for this. Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> so clearly for this ecosystem to grow, for these startups to grow, for these companies to flourish, you've had very fertile ground, a very fertile environment in Ukraine. And yet I'm, I'm, I'm also aware of the fact that the government hasn't been very involved in creating this fertile ground. Or has Maybe it, that's a good thing. Maybe that's a good thing. So tell me a little bit about, you know, what, what, should, what can or should the government do to accelerate this, this like, trajectory towards a data science hub? Or should they not do anything at all? Well, but you see, the, this particular house was built from grassroots. I know some people that are standing there who, it's because of their energy, this particular house was created. It's relatively modest, it's relatively small, unlike some across the street, uh, where, the, where, the government, where the government actively participated with, with, with its money. I think this is much more valuable. This is much more valuable. I think that you will not hear about the story of the government involvement in creation of Silicon Valley in 1948-49. Those were uh, orange groves in California. There were certain bills that allowed people who were coming from the war uh, to settle there, and that was about it. It was few, prof few students from Stanford University and others who created what is today's Silicon Valley. Sometimes government needs to step back. Sometimes government, and, and by the way, there are many examples around the world of failed government investment in um, so-called Silicon Valleys. Uh, some countries spend hundreds of billions of dollars to recreate it. Sometimes it helps for a few years, but then eventually the effort goes down. It's really grassroots. There are so many talented people already here in universities. Let them do things well. Give them a little bit break on taxes. Give them a little bit break on auditors' reports and things like that. Let them just do whatever they could to bring more capital. They're so attractive, they're so smart, they have so much energy. VC investors will build investors all over not to build. people want to be in the system. So that's so important. Just give the freedom. Freedom really deals everything. Yeah, yeah, I'm as a IT guy, and as Alexei say in Ukraine, we can, you know, I, I'm still working on IT. I have five percent tax. So uh, you w was wonder about that fact so as well, and that's a lot of guys who live in Europe. They say, "What? How much? Five? That's nothing. That's that's we pay like uh, ten times more." And that's exactly, and that's what exactly helped to grow this, uh, grow this, uh, you know, 
I, I can say, ecosystem. That's why people don't want to go to Poland. They, that's actually the, our not main competitor, but they are neighbors and uh, organically people easily can learn uh, Polish and they move back and forth. I have uh, examples when people leave and back. So that's that's organic and, and we government should not balance that. That's that's business will balance that with the w but what government can do just support with what with this tax platform that that's good as well. Uh, as a member of parliament, I think it's a question to me also because I think I'm a little bit responsible from the viewpoint of uh, what we have to do. Uh, I think that uh, from the viewpoint of business, uh, the best was that the government were not absolutely not seeing that what we, such industry were existing. So we just like it seems to me you used this analogy that we was like a tree through the asphalt possibility to grow up and then. Uh, so, uh, as I think it's a very good analogy. Uh, but for now, the industry becomes so big and so mature that I think that the key question is education. I think we need not only to keep the level of education, but to raise up. We have to go up from informatics to the software development in school. We have to raise the level, we have to implement good ideas with the lyceums, with the uh, possibility to diversify education in different levels and give possibility to very talented people to receive more sophisticated, uh, uh, more hard education and so on and so off. So this is the direction where we really need the help of the government. Besides this, I think that we have not to be afraid that a lot of people are going abroad like it was this the same practice of uh, a lot of countries who were developed. So if we'll make the atmosphere, business atmosphere first of all, better, uh, if we'll implement the rule of law, which I think is the most cr critical to Ukraine to have the normal courts, I think we'll have the situation much better with investment and I think that there will be the situation that the people will start returning with a lot of practices, with a, with a lot of business knowledge to return back and to build the country. So from my point of view, the main role for now for our industry is educational and the second institutional, yes, to uh, if you need to have the stock exchange, you have to have a rule of law. If you need to have a good education, if you need a good software companies, you have a rule of law. So two, two major questions. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Dmitry Shymky, Presidential Administration of Ukraine. I, have a, I would like to bring the discussion back to data and the global context. I think it's great. Um, I, I understood that uh, Ukraine was not mentioned, but over the last three years, Ukraine moved to the 31st rank globally on the open data. And it's been driven by the government and civil society. And though there is a significant portion of the data being published. But I would like to move further because we in Davos and the Davos is looking forward. Many governments are looking to the different regulation for the data and data management, which is connected with AI, which is connected with self-driving cars, with drones and other. To which extent the government should interfere in the development of their uh, contemporary technology are regulating it, especially connecting with the data. Thank you. G government should ask sh should ask professionals, um, not bureaucrats, but with all respect, Dima, uh, but professionals uh, who are uh, professionals in ethics, uh, in in uh, in questions of healthcare, uh, privacy. Uh, ask them how would they like to self-regulate this? The best ideas come from self-regulation. And once those ideas are developed, then government can help to structure those. Then it will be easy to enforce because it will be created not from the top, but I don't want to say from the bottom, but from, uh, from the people who actually think about those things and dedicated their life. Those are not easy things. You know, healthcare data, um, some countries say it has to be held inside the country. Majority. I would argue, majority of the country, I would argue that there are some countries that are safer to keep care than some, some, some other. And, and you know, maybe, uh, so, so it seems like a good intention of the government, perhaps, but it can be used in the wrong way. 
why not to give all the da healthcare data to Switzerland, for example? You know, it used to keep everybody's gold. Uh, now, I'm, I'm just... Is that a sovereignty I'm, topic? Uh, so, so the, but the question is, that's when, when, when uh, people start throwing those words like sovereignty, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That really means taxation, that really means more bureaucrats, some... Cyber security, cyber yeah, not to forget. Cyber security, but again, the best, the best regulation always came from the industry. Uh, the Hippocrat, uh, not Hipp uh, how what's the doctors uh, always, Hippocratic, it wasn't designed by, uh, by a Greek uh, uh, you know, it, 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 doctors themselves inst instituted that and doctors themselves, you know, follow their rules and they disbar a doctor who breaks the rules. Uh, it's, he's, he shouldn't be disbarred by the government. It's, a, it's your own community that expels you for doing things wrong. Is the most powerful tool. And I think that issues of cybersecurity, virus, etc., uh, etc., et they could all be solved without much government involvement. Less regulation is better, except those fields where re re regulation is essential. Just an, a good example, which is uh, easier to understand, is regulation for the drones. Sooner or later we will have the situation that uh, a lot of them will be flying in the air. So of course it's uh, absolutely obvious, it's common sense that we need some kind of regulation for this. But my opinion that the business have to think how to do this better and to present the government how to do this. With the same or other, let's take the uh, crypto technologies we have today, the, the uh, fantastic panel here in uh, Ukraine house and uh, this is the also very important question where we have to uh, do something but Dima sorry this is a question of qualification of the people in the government who are understanding what is Bitcoin what is blockchain and so on and so off so it's better to give the professionals to make a right decision and explain to the government what regulation we have to implement I uh, thinking that uh, less we have regulated, uh, the better we have the situation. The worst example is how we regulated the uh, access to the data in our government structure for uh, the communication and for the security. In a lot of cases, is the biggest break, which is not allowed to the government to demand. So that's why we don't need this case to. Uh, international uh, standards, international regulation, and to take off uh, these barriers uh, from uh, Ukraine. You know, on, I really like your drones example. Uh, I have never met a guy who built a drone and wants to lose it in a collusion with another drone. Somehow two guys who build two drones will have a, an idea of how to make them not, uh, you the know, collide. Is not a problem. Now, <laughs> however, it's those two guys, three, five guys, that should come up with ideas how to regulate the space and then go to the government and say, please help us to regulate that. That's what happened with first airplanes and first helicopters. Uh, you know, Wright Brothers didn't get a grant from, uh, from North Carolina <laughs> municipality to develop a flying machine. And because then the governor of North Carolina would have told them, you know, it has to fly, not higher, not lower. That and that by would the way, have never I have been the built. Opposite pro I have an opposite example, by the way. Uh, you know the state New Jersey. You have to. I, I see it from uh, my the window. The governor of this uh, New Jersey is saying, hey, guys, we have only two industries. One is, is the house for the rich people on the seashore, and another we have a big airfield, which I think it's better to use for the drone technology. So he started to implement, to uh, give funds and to give money to the small uh, companies who is uh, devote themselves to the drone technology. So we have, see here at the good examples, at the uh, government understanding the necessity of development, of uh, institutional development, of investment, of real investment, and how accurately they do in this. Right, but any, any representative of government should be like Dmitry. He should wake up and the first thought should be how could I help businesses and creative to people to make less to, regulation. To make less regulation and to do things right. If the government wakes up and thinks about 
how could I, you know, establish rules that I just happened to see in my night dream? That's a bad government. Good government listens first and then helps communities to, to succeed. I just want to comment on this course, because, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, and, and again, I want to bring it back to global discussion because unfortunately, DGI drones are banned in U.S for flying and collecting Not everywhere. Not everywhere, you can but, but country, state by state. We see governments in the different regulation of the social media in Germany. We see regulation, strong regulation over the data policy in UK. And we see more emergence on the regulation on data management coming from the government. And what I observe that the industry, very often reluctant because it's a competition sometimes. So I think that the governments Globally, I'm not talking just Ukraine, I'm talking globally, we'll move there. And I understand that that might lead to destru destruction of the industries. And that's why I appreciate your comments on the involvement in the industry. Thank you. Dima, I can only comment that we are living in more strange world than it was 10 years ago. And uh, especially we have a lot of examples when uh, this is uh, known data regulation which is now implemented in Europe and that a lot of companies, especially from Germany, come to us and say, hey guys, help us, we don't know what to do with this. So this is a very typical situation, and we're all becoming strong, uh, stranger and stranger. Uh, so we have to accept this and uh, to say, hey, there will be no more easy year or no easy regulation. So, and trying to find in each particular case what to do the, with this just because of, uh, and especially taking in consideration the question which we're not discussing now, which is not the uh, team, uh, the question of our panel, is the cyber security, which is uh, uh, making the fire to our normal life. You know, I have a question here. Uh, hi, I'm a journalist from Ukraine, Stas Vrasov, Ligonet. And uh, to summarize it, I have a question, uh, maybe it's obvi obvious. When uh, does uh, artificial intelligence uh, replace uh, the government itself? Because uh, it seems to me that uh, all the communities, they have a lot of expertise in different fields, but government does not. <laughs> can, can, <laughs> Maybe can I, have an answer can, for this. Can, can I start uh, that? So uh, that was just uh, one month ago in the California they had a NIPS conference where the topic of ethic of neural network and machine learning, artificial intelligence was a hot topic. The, uh, and the, the people said, okay, if machine will decide, take me credit or not. So that's uh, how, you know, who will explain me this decision? Because that's a mathematician formula which say no. And nobody explained why. In the bank, they say, oh, you know, you look like not good, your suit is not new. So, uh, and potentially you have five kids and uh, they will eat all your money, you, you will not be able to return it back. So there is explanation. And uh, the government do the same function, that's regulate the society. But if we will replace with machine, you can imagine that the first time that's... If, if I can add, I can say that artificial intelligence is not so smart and our U Ukrainian government is not so <laughs> stupid. So uh, this is the, the two-way road. Uh, so that's why I, I, I think that uh, we have to wait at least 100 years from this point of view. I think that the easier way is to find the smarter people uh, to put them in the government, like Dmitry, as a good example. Do you think he's an alien? <laughs> 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 he is IT professional. He's an IT professional who occasionally came to the government and still here. So right. maybe he is an island. Maybe it's a good idea. Yeah. Thank you. I will think we have Martian. to think. Martians. Yeah, yeah, we have to think about this. But, but uh, uh, regarding your question, global economy, what government all should do? They should do islands and discuss the topic globally. Okay. Like do special conference where they say, okay, how? We so what's happening with the Wi-Fi Bluetooth standards? So they regulated by the IEEE or another societies. They sitting. In a, in a, with the professionals, they discuss what kind of uh, coding transfer uh, frequency should be, how we will use this and this and this in this country. So the same should be with the data, because you know how hard to push the uh, electronic health record in, I don't know, in our country, but I speak with a, in uh, Dublin with their uh, government, they say, we spent six years to discuss this uh, electronic records and what's uh, but they approve that, uh, and uh, now it's, it's hugely bootstrapped the medical startups 
Why? Because this is a point of data exchange for all small businesses. So I think that's what all people should do. They should discuss not only politics topic, but as well some technical topics like data regulation on the world level. Thank you. I think we're, we are about to wrap up, but I hope we lived up to our promise of not only an engaging but provocative panel discussion, especially with this great group of panelists. So thank you very much for your time and your candor and your, your thoughts around all of these great questions and topics. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for moderation. And now we have a little bit of time for, for networking here. So I just kindly ask you for your help with chairs because we need to put them on top of each other and move them to the walls. So we have a little bit of space to talk to each other and meet each other. <laughs> Just you want a photo? Well done. Let's make a photo. Okay.